saying on my oh well yes now hello everyone I, I was saying on my Facebook event we are at our, our third episode with artist talk and I'm really pleased to have with us Justin Mortimer hi Justin from hello, everyone. Morning. Yeah, a really uh, uh, dear friend and uh, amazing artist from um, from UK uh, and we're gonna have a chat with him about uh, painting and the practice of painting, which I know he loves to talk about it because he was uh, in our department like three years ago uh, mm. with the occasion of the exhibition of our colleague uh, Marius Bercia. So we spent like two days together and you visit our department. And I remember you were quite interested with talking with the students like extensive <laughs> and yeah absolutely it's very it's very very important and, and mm -hmm. endlessly fascinating you know I, so, I was very struck um well I, I was saying to you earlier on just how just how marvelous I thought your art school was and just how intensive I thought the artists that the students were working there but very very intense and very very serious and I, and I, I really got I really enjoyed that yeah. It, was, um, it, it smelled like an art school, you know. It had uh, it, was paint. it was just yeah, yeah. yeah. I think now when I visit art schools in the UK, everything is very digital. A lot of it. Maybe now more painting is coming in, and more, more younger artists are more interested in painting again. But certainly, a few years before, British art schools were very. They were more like um, laboratories. Oh. Whereas I felt when I visited Cluj in 2017, the art so, school was like art schools have always been somehow. It's, uh, yeah. It was smelling of turpentine, right? And yeah, turpentine. Yeah, yeah. And I love the way everyone was so pressed together. I mean, maybe that's not great for the students having so little space, but somehow that intensified the activity of making work, and students were able to look around them and see what else was what what their neighbours were doing and. It just fed into this energy, you know. Yeah, I really liked, I loved it. And also, I love the fact that <clears throat> I love the fact you had a life model there still. You know, you you don't see that so much now. So that was great. Since yeah. we are talking about uh, being in school, and uh, you remembered your um, going through school, I wanted to ask you uh, how. But just before this, just before I'm putting my first question, I want to say that everyone should um, come into our dialogue and uh, prepare questions. Just okay. Justin is here for uh, everything we have in mind, like questions, just uh, get it on. I'm gonna, just in a few moments, I'm gonna also make a presentation, you know, to see his works and why we are talking. Uh, you can also put the question in the chat or directly uh, with the voice. Well, I was saying that, uh, so you went into school, art school, right? And for how many years did you went there? I went to art school aged 18, which is quite young, really. And I was there for four years. And that oh, yeah. was an under that was yeah, and that's an undergraduate course. So I didn't do a master's. In fact, I applied for a master's at the Royal Academy School in London, and I got rejected. So, which was actually really good because it meant that I was able just to get a studio very quickly <clears throat> and, and start working as an artist at the age of twenty-two. And I just approached it quite seriously and thought, "This is my this is my um, my job now." Right? And I had to work hard to. To survive and I, at the time I won a portrait competition when I was 21 in London and part of the prize was to have painting of a famous person put on the wall of the National Portrait Gallery and so that was like a poster for my work if you like I was able to it was like advertising my skills as a portrait painter which wasn't something I wanted to do but I was able to sell sell the portraits and make money and, and pay the studio rent. So that's kind of how it all started, really. 
Yeah. Yeah, because that was my question. But you answered it already. Like what? Sorry. what <laughs> yeah. 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 Because you know our students like they do three years of uh, of work and then another two weeks, two years of master and probably PhD okay. for another two, three years. But at the yeah. end, they you know they have to go out in the world. So that was what I was mm -hmm. uh, meaning mm. to ask you uh, to men to ask you that. What was the first thing you do once you found yourself out there in the world? And you well, just cer certainly what we all did as students to, to, to begin the journey was we, we entered every single art competition that was available to us. We used to go through art magazines and look in the back for all the competitions that were available for open okay. submission. You'd maybe pay five pounds or ten pounds to enter your picture, and often you'd get rejected. But now and again, we, we would um, get accepted. And as a group of artists, we often used to walk together to the, the galleries and give the work, and and attend the exhibitions and speak to everyone. And that's kind of it gives you that bit of confidence. Also, you, you have know? a group of friends, artist friends, who you were hanging out back then yeah of course and that's a very very important part of further education and art and art school isn't it, it it's the the cohort it's your it, it's your group you're with which you feed off and uh, and epic question and fall in love with and, and throw ideas around with that that's that that was very very important and it kind of sustains you through the difficult times and, and it, it and uh, interestingly, a lot of us are now back in contact again, as we've all hit about 50. We're all now, we're all, we're all now becoming 50 years old, and we're all, we're all meeting again on Zoom and things like that. It's, it's kind of... Oh, really? Kind of, so you're still in contact yeah. with, that, with that? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and some people have some amazing careers. Some, most people don't have any career at all. And uh, some, are doing, some are doing well. So it's, it's quite a high rate of of failure art school education realistically as we all know um, many people have found it very very difficult to sustain a life as an artist having said that a lot of people i was at college with diversed into art related jobs like filmmaking and directing and tv that kind of thing not everyone was a painter it's just a few of us managed to live as painters but not many it's because I was able to do to do the portraiture, which I I explained earlier, that enabled me to um, continue this life. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's what I I like about uh, you and your practice that I'm, we are going to talk about because you are the kind of painter who goes every day. Of course, now you are uh, with the lockdown in England. There's been a pause, but you moved a little bit of your studio yeah. in your home, so it's kind of the yeah. same thing. Uh, but you know, you're the the kind of uh, artist who goes every day in the studio mm. and um, takes it as a, a daily part of uh, of your life. So yeah. I was wondering, do you have like I don't know some some little things you do before you get started, or something that gets you in the <laughs> yeah. mood, or you just go in your studio and yeah, massive, to your massive canvas. distraction, yeah, yeah, massive distraction things like uh, <laughs> making coffee, sharpening pencils, and to, yeah, putting off the hour for actual painting. It's uh, it's amazing how many jobs I have to do before I actually commit to making some work. It's funny. Um, I mean, yeah, it takes me about an hour to travel to my studio every day because my studio is in South London. I'm in North London, oh. so I travel on, on the underground and it gives me that time to think about what oh. I'm going to do, you know. You do the thinking on the way then. Kind of, yeah, I do. And also when I leave the studio of an evening, I have an hour. I have a, I have a, a buffer zone between my, my art life and my home life. And in that time, I can... I can decompress the ideas and thoughts can, can wash away from me. So I'm not bringing the angst back home, you know? So going to the studio, I will invariably get there about 10 o'clock in the morning every day. And um, I might do some collaging first. I quite often do digital collaging, which I've explained. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, that's quite, that's become quite a, a big part of what I do. 
because I'll, I'll come in and I'll see the big, I'll see a big painting on the wall as I walk in. And that's my first, it's the first time I've seen that painting since I've been to bed. And, and in the, the night before, I might have left that painting, been quite pleased with myself, thinking I nailed it there. And of course, you come in in the morning and go, Jesus Christ, <laughs> what an absolute horror show. Who was, I, who, was I, who was I fooling, you know? And that's quite important, that instant moment. And um, so I will address that. I will either scrape it off or think about it. I might photograph it on my camera and then maybe I might um, Put that put that photo into my computer and then play around with it on Photoshop. Certainly, in the past, I would make a print. I'd make a paper print of an mm -hmm. of that painting and maybe play around with it and just kind of create a map, an idea of where I want to go with that painting in the day. And that's kind of how I do it. Hmm, this is really interesting. So you kind of do a checkup of your work from the. Earlier That's an interesting, day, interesting, yeah, using, interesting expression. Using your camera and uh, transferring the the image into your computer and maybe uh, play a little bit with it and to see what happens yeah. if, if you go in one direction or the other or uh, yes. So yes. This, uh huh. Because it's, it's, it, it's very useful, but it's also it, it's very seductive. The digital technique but it can be quite corrupting as well because in of one way corrupting it's, it's, it's not reality I you're know. not you're not really dealing with with uh -huh. the plastic that the painting in front of you it, it's kind of it's almost cowardice in some respects um i mean it saves wasting paint i suppose but you i have to make sure i don't do it for too long because you can you can collage and, and doodle around on a computer forever and end up with nothing <laughs> it's like, well, I have, you know so I have to stop myself and go, right, now I do the painting. And I I have to be able to, I need to be painting for at least four hours before I get to that zone. You know, you know what we're all, you all know what I'm talking about. You have to get to that point where your, your brain is thinking in a completely new way and everything else, time has kind of drifted. And you might have some music on studio, which I do sometimes with headphones. And it's, it's that little moment of clarity after about three or four hours of work, where you have maybe two or three hours of, of um, lucidness, you know? Do you know that word? Kind of clarity, and lucidness. And then it will, then it will fade away. So by about six o'clock, seven o'clock in the evening, I'm, I'm clearing up, I'm washing my brushes and I'm going home. That's it. That's kind of how it works. So I tend to do my best work Late, late in the afternoon, actually. Whereas mm -hmm. I know a lot of artist friends of mine have to be in the studio at nine o'clock, painting by 10. And that's when they're freshest and they do their best work. I can't do that. I need time to really warm up, you know, like a long distance runner, maybe. It's, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it's an endurance uh, then. It is, it is, isn't it? It is, yeah. Uh, when I've been on holiday, I find working really difficult because my stamina has dropped. My energy to sustain painting for hours on end is gone. It's gone. My yeah. arm even hurt. I'm like, exactly. oh, is that how much a brush weighs? You know. <laughs> well, in holidays you have to have a good time, so <laughs> that's it's right. demanding. That's <laughs> it's it. <your> time. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it takes yeah. a lot of energy to do this. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. Just you said you 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 wash your brushes after each session of painting. Mostly, yeah, mostly. Oh, so you're really you really like to take care of your stuff. I do because I really hate I really hate walking in in the morning and clearing up all the crap. <laughs> I can't stand it. I, I hate that. I, I want to walk in and I've got clean newspaper on my palette. Next to my palette, I've got the brushes are drying. I cleaned last night, so it makes it as easy as possible for me just to start again. If I've just got all the rubbish lying around, I I can't I can't do it. But there we go. Some people that's just me. That's just me. Yeah. Yeah, because I was wondering. So you need a kind of a logical space in which, yeah. or does mm. the space need to have a little bit of logic before you go into the. Yeah, I think so. ideas 
Yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so at least the brushes should be right then, right? Exactly. <laughs> if, the painting, if you're entering the, the unknown field of the painting, at least the brushes the brushes should know their place. Yeah, the right? brushes know what, what they're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's been weird having running two studios now because my studio in I'm at home now in my, my lockdown studio because we're in a second lockdown again. So I'm painting upstairs in a small room. So, But I've got all my best brushes are upstairs. And then this afternoon, I'm allowed to travel to my studio. And I, I can't... I, I'm having to have... Because, you know, we all have our favourite brushes, our favourite palette knives. There's only one of those. So I can't decide where to keep them. Do I keep them in my <laughs> lockdown studio? Do I keep them in my London studio? I don't know. I can't decide. It's weird. And I'm buying a lot of paint now because I'm having to have two sets of paints, you know. That's getting really expensive. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> How would it be your, your favorite brush? What, what's that? Well, do you know, I've got, I've got some amazing brushes that are really, really old because they just don't make brushes like this anymore. I'm going to have to ask some professional brush makers to make them for me. And I've tried to track them down. They're kind of... that when, when I first had them, they were... I mean, this is a pencil, but... So, so I had the shaft of the brush, and then on top of the the, the metal bit, the, the brush, they were very long and thin and flat, mm. oil brush, oil, oil paint brushes. And they don't make them like that. Mostly brushes are about that short, aren't they? Or depending on their yeah. width, they're not yeah. very long. And I, and I did the whole series of paintings where I could get really long, beautiful, liquid brush marks. And uh, you just don't see those brushes. You just don't. And I, I go to... Well, before the whole COVID thing, I'd, I'd be doing a bit of traveling. So when I was abroad, say in Berlin, I'd go to this very famous brush shop in Berlin, for instance, which some of you may know. Or in Brussels, there's some really good brush shops. Uh, London has some really good brush shops as well. Um, but I've never found some, never found them like that before. And also, there was a lady who lived next door to me here in London, and her husband used to be a scene painter in the films back in the 50s and 60s. And he died and she gave me a lot of his old brushes, which must have been made in the 1940s. And I still use those. They're kind of splintering and breaking down now, but I love those. And without going on too much about brushes, one thing I love about brushes are the really old ones that are broken and dirty and messy. You know, I don't like new brushes uh, oh. particularly. I like, I like the ones that are splintered and, and create quite a dirty, um, corrupted mark, you know? Yeah. So you like brushes with like, the history? Yeah, brushes with the history and yeah. yeah. No, but I, I, mean, I, I sorry, I just I paint, with, I, I paint with loads of things, you know. Paint with crazy things. Chopsticks, oh, wow. washing up brushes, you know, anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I think it's important for students to know your this this um part of being interested about materials because as you mm -hmm. explained about these brushes so there is a link right between uh the marks the things you can do on your painting with just a specific paint uh, kind of of brush so that brush gives you yeah. the opportunity to yeah. you know to make uh not a better painting but to reach directly more in a more directly way to an idea you have. So a tool yes. can give you that. So this is why it's important for you to have a certain type of, of brush because... That's right, that's right? right. Because you know you know that I'm a painter that's interested in, in surfaces and different substances to, exactly. to render. So, I, so all my brushes will reflect that. I will have brushes that w w which make certain marks for, for, for reasons, you know? either to describe that surface. So whether you're stippling something or you want a liquid brush or you want something that's very fine or you want something that's soft so you can um, create edges that aren't too hard and blending. Um, sometimes you want a brush to make a very open rough mark. But lots of, and I need many of those to make. So I have hundreds and hundreds of brushes, you know, for that exact reason. They all have their, they all have their roles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I'm going to go to sharing screen. I'm going to say hi also to my colleague Andrei Churderescu. He's here. You've also met in back. Yes, I, I have. I remember. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hi. So, uh, because we are talking about uh, already about 
the image images you are creating. So I'm gonna go to Instagram, the famous. Instagram. Okay. You all see my screen, right? And now you're seeing um, Justin's Instagram Instagram page, right? Confirm this to me. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Look, this is just a glance of <laughs> of the. Yeah. Brand right that, that's that, that's a few of them yeah that's about a third of them i'd say of, yeah of the small ones yeah this will take a, a quite a while to to wash then <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what when they, so before i built see before i built that wooden thing they're all in i used to have them in old cans and i'd it always knock them off mm. and it would take me ages just putting them all back in the cans so yeah oh I, that's yeah, terrible yeah yeah that's why yeah. they're there yeah. This is better. This is a, mm. a better, the box. Mm. And my palette there is just an old door that I'm painting on. What? It, on this? Yeah, see, yeah, that's an old, you know, for Micah, like a kitchen door, a kitchen oh. cupboard door. And I found it in the street. So, in fact, I've had that one since I was a student. Then underneath, underneath that is a sheet of glass, which I also paint on. But oh. for this, for a particular paint, I have palettes for different reasons, you know. Um, so I have brushes for, for different reasons. I have palettes for different reasons. Um, so sometimes I paint off a white palette and sometimes I paint off a green palette. And also I have wooden palettes that I carry, you know, old fashioned style. Yeah. And you use that for what, the, the wooden palette? Uh, if I want to be very, if I want to be moving around a lot, uh -huh. uh, this, these are the picture you've got up now is when um, I was painting at home. And you'll notice that the paint is all on the left hand side uh, because I was painting with my left hand there. I'm a right handed oh. painter. That's my left hand. So that was when I was painting when I broke my hand. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about uh, this little detail. I was meaning to ask you about this later yeah. since you brought it up right now. Uh, yeah. Interesting fact, right? About the, our guest here today. He broke his arm during this pandemic, right? When this I broke my hand. It was happened. my hand. Yeah. When when did it happen, Justin? In May. In May. So and, uh, unfortunately I had a I mean, I was working towards an exhibition that is now coming to an end in Korea. So it's a big exhibition with 29 paintings. Most of the work had been done, but I made 15 paintings for the show, including this one you're showing. And yeah. during and during the period of painting those, I yeah, I, I stupidly broke my hand, which was a total disaster. And to be and actually, I, I broke this bone here, all along here, and I have I have this finger now has minimal movement, and it oh. has affected the way I paint a little bit. I have to say. But I'm, I've been doing a lot of exercises on it, and um, I'm, you'll find me always doing this. <laughs> I'm always stretching this ligament that comes all the way down. <laughs> well, as as artists, you know, we depend on our limbs, right, to be able to paint. Yeah, we see this eyes, blue. Of course. Exactly. But, you see this blue face here, at the top of my top of the screen on the on the right hand side. You see that? Oh, it's gone. Yeah. That one. Yeah. See that? That was the first picture I did with my left hand. So because how can, how was it? You can it? see I have no control there at all. It was total chaos. It was like what? learning from the start all over again. Yeah. So this was what happened. You you need to to learn again how to control yeah. your hands to be able to. Yeah. As you are a pretty realistic painter, not yeah. not on the whole surface of the canvas, but you have some some uh, spots where you really define the texture and uh, the form and the volume and so you so you kind of yeah. need to to move all your hand muscle <laughs> muscles how was it yeah. to, to you know to to move on the other to work with the other side of your brain basically? yes it was very very tricky it was very very difficult but um i will say that i i had to do it for like two or three months and by the end by the end I really did improve. I could really feel it changing in me. I could feel a kind of a power growing in me. It was the, maybe it was the neuron starting to reconnect. Yeah. Um, that's a left-handed picture. So I'm starting to feel a bit. Yeah. Well, the brain. Paint, but then I have paint. I have painted this guy before, so I was. Um, I kind of knew this guy's head. 
I've painted this guy about three times now. And uh, so I kind of knew I had a muscle memory. Uh, <laughs> Except the brain was already the brain already did the work only the hand you yeah. have to... that's well said that's well said yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly the, yeah. the brain knew what to do on the hand wasn't really well yeah. this is what was so extraordinary maybe you should all try it later on but when you literally can't do and i couldn't do anything with this hand i couldn't I, so even opening a, a, a can or doing you can't do it with one hand it's i had to find ways to do it even squeezing out paint was tricky and um so your brain knows exactly what to do but your hand is really not doing it hmm. and it's quite it's quite incredible to see how badly you are your hand moves when you're trying to do, i couldn't decide do i start from this way you know when you see people maybe some of you out there are left-handed and you're used to it but you write in that way i didn't know how to hold my brush to, to, I didn't know which way to pull the brush mark. I couldn't. <laughs> Maybe we should all yeah. do an, exper an experiment like this in the painting studios when we meet, and we will send yeah. you the photographs. Do the same thing. That'd image. be very interesting. Left hand and with the right hand, with yeah. all our students, and then uh, see the results. I think all students should do it, definitely. You know, and I yeah. think this people is would talk. Justin, huh? we just we we are just announcing our my next team to my students from the second year. Beware, my students! So our next team will be this experiment with painting something. We'll figure out what with with the other hand. <laughs> I, have two, I have two. Both my kids are left-handed. I don't know where from. We don't have That's anybody in our history of family history works with <laughs> with left hand, but they are both left-handed. So fascinating. Uh, Right. Yeah, I will try it too. I think you should make a very complicated proposition, like a raccourci or something. Yeah. <laughs> Full size. <laughs> a left-handed raccourci. What do you say, Justin? Okay. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. It's got to be done. It, it'll be very, very annoying. You To only make it of interest, you've got to do it for quite a long time. But it might be also, it'll open your eyes to see how, how much how much skill your, your your proper hand does has learned yours and it might be worth breaking it down a little bit to see to see that well in the end this this uh experience taught you something about painting you you think you understood um, something you didn't before yeah i certainly realized uh you 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 get used to the marks that you've learned how to make over years you, you get um you're you're almost a cliche of yourself so to have a opportunity to break through that a bit i mean this is a left-handed picture for instance you've shown T to suddenly be more aware of how the paint moves because I, i'm 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 an artist who's learned how to control paint quite carefully you know and to actually find out what paint does when you can't control it was very beneficial you understand um i was able to let the materiality of the paint do its thing that mm. my control it was much more like um like a musician going freestyle or like that's some sort of, it's much more jazz like or a intuitive instinctive approach to making art rather than um controlling it and sometimes to break down the control and the skill is a very very good thing i mean throughout art school and later people have always been telling me to to break down what i've trained myself to be good at you know mm -hmm. it's, it's very good to undo certain um habits that you you've, you've created for yourself uh, so that that was that was educational for me you know mm -hmm. and I, I i could see that uh, there's this whole bandwidth this whole breadth of mark making that is available to me through my left hand and I, I did seriously think about painting with both hands on paintings and i did try that painting with both left and right bring something new into the work mm. Mm. freshness yeah yeah so, so you managed to finish the painting for your korean uh, show yeah i finished well I, I got to a point where i I just couldn't finesse the paintings. You had to let them stay at that level. For instance, the one you have on the screen now, it's only about a meter high. 
and the detail yeah you see so mm -hmm. that's in my spare room so you can see how in fact that that doesn't matter <laughs> so, so that actually made the poster for the exhibition which is quite funny so that painting which is quite small was made into a banner a poster which is about 15 meters wide in korea it's huge so that was quite funny seeing all the paint spatters and all the uh, my I'm, tiny I'm, room in north london to this huge banner in south korea <laughs> and probably yeah, I, you are the only one who knew the history of the of the image of the painting yeah that's right that's right that hand thing and everything but i deeply regret breaking the hand it, it's it's going to cause me trouble now for the rest of my life so i wouldn't recommend it <laughs> yeah well, I'm gonna in a crazy period. Crazy period. I'm not gonna ask you what what happened, but um, I imagine well, it, just, it was. Yeah, I just got angry. I just I just lashed out at a wall, and uh, because <laughs> I, I I'd been ill. There was anxiety here. There was um, it was bad time, and um, yeah. So I just got angry one day and punched a wall, and um, it, I punched it too hard. <laughs> yeah. what, what, in fact, my, my brother my brother's a my brother's a surgeon, and. Uh, he, he specialises in hand. Yeah, and it's a classic. It's a classic macho injury. It's classic. Oh. And yeah. he said, Justin, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> crazy, uh, crazy stuff. People, I I wanted to, uh, if you have questions for Justin, to to go on because I'm putting this next uh, question for for Justin, and then if you want to, you can join uh, the discussion on the chat or live. Uh, but until then, Justin, I wanted to to ask mm. you because you have uh, what is your relationship with uh, photography, and uh, not just uh, well, photography as you know uh, as a medium because it, photography for you it's a medium, it's part of the process. So tell me absolutely. about it about this how do you yeah, well, firstly why? firstly i'm a spectacularly bad photographer which is <laughs> probably a good thing I, I have absolutely no control i have I, i'm very very poor at um composing in the camera lens i just take snaps you know just really really quickly i mean these are photographs of my professional photographer shooting the work so these lamps aren't mine these, ah, these are his ah, like, ah. yeah so, I mean, I, I tend to use photographs um, which I find in magazines or on the internet. I prefer other people's images, really, which I then collage because it gives me a, it gives me a distance somehow. I mean, when I, when I try to use my... I do use my own photographs a lot, of course. I mean, I don't use everyone's, yeah. any, anyone else's all the time. Um, but, but also, I like the language, the visual language of it. I, I, I bring to the work. So... For instance, the old-fashioned flash photography. I, I love the way it um, it bleaches out the uh, surface and makes volume kind of collapse. And you're just left with the, with the line, the drawing, if you like. You mm -hmm. know? Um, so, so I, I do look. I do look for those type of images. And um, I have bought image. I have bought actual photographs off eBay, old vintage photographs, which I have used. Um, especially a lot of the paintings I was making, maybe. Uh, eight years ago, I was buying photographs off eBay of wounded soldiers and things like that, which then became part of a lot of the work I was showing in America of um, broken limbs and surgery and that kind of thing. Yeah, I remember. Plus, that. I was taking photographs in hospitals. Yeah, and I was taking my own photographs in hospitals as well. I mean, there was a lot of paintings of um, uh, X-ray machines and which were x-raying me at the time which i was photographing and then putting back into the work so there's a lot of that which i use uh, i i am photographing things a lot but because I'm, I'm actually not that interested in making photographs in fact i would say i'm not but i do like the visual language of it and i and uh, along with a lot of other artists we are trying to navigate our way through this huge world of photography i mean look this is um me putting up a show of all my collage work. It's all photographic based, you can see, but deeply manipulated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's a very, very good tool. But the thing is, when I was at art school, I mean, my art teacher at school, and I mean, that when I was a schoolboy, and then my art teacher in art school, they, it was absolutely the not, 
the thing to do. You did not work from photography. It was absolutely um, almost unlawful in their in their world. You know, you couldn't do that. You had to work from life all the time. Observation, observation, and imagination, which is absolutely important. And in some ways, I I, I deeply respect that. Um, but when I went to art school at eighteen, we we just had a life model sitting in a chair for a whole term. And I thought this is absolutely boring. I cannot connect with this. There's no there's no essence of life here. There's no energy. Mm-hmm. So I, and I started to collect and paint from sort of pop magazines and um, fashion magazines in about 1989, 1990, stuff like that. Interesting. I've got a great, a big memory of, um, you know, well, of course, you'll, rem- you'll, you'll remember the whole, the Romanian orphan uh, this sort of debacle that came out in the late 80s. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. In the news? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, the, yeah, yeah. And there were photographs, very famous ones in the media. And I remember painting, starting to paint from one of those photographs of a child in their cot. And uh, my, my, my tutor at college was, was deeply shocked that I should be doing this. I, I wasn't, I didn't understand it at the time, but in a way she was saying, it, I wasn't allowed to work from this, partly because A, it's a photograph, but actually more importantly, it morally somehow, I couldn't just use this image for my own validation. It, it, it was not allowed, you know, it's just, I, I, I couldn't, it was voyeurism in her, her mind, me mm-hmm. using this image. So no, that, that's, um, yeah, that was an important lesson to use. So if I do use photographs, I want to manipulate them a lot because it has to take a big journey from the source material. Otherwise it's not interesting. Yeah, in they, fact, um, they, they just in start fact, this week, right? They're yeah, just, yeah. Um, I mean, I realized I, I, I forget that, you know, I mean, for instance, I was painting, I was trying to paint some portraits of Kathy, my partner here at home, based on photographs that I took of her in the evening. And I started painting and I was painting them all weekend. And I realized it was pointless because I hadn't made a journey far enough away from the original photograph even though I was changing the colors and the position, it still wasn't enough. So yeah, my relationship with photography is, is uh, I also is, uh, it works. That... It works when I'm distant from, it. yeah. Ah, mm-hmm. You also have all this, um, I've seen it on your uh, photographs as, uh, I see them more as sketches, sketches from which you, you depart yeah. your your painting, but you also have. I know what that is, but I want you to tell uh, the students more. What, where was that paint? Yes, most of them. You have this. Um, yes, but on many of them, yeah. I've seen this. Uh, this kind of um, how do you call this in English? Everyone. Ir- what do you mean? This smoke. Grid? This smoke thing. No. The, <laughs> Grid. The geometry, the, yes, the the grid. Oh, the grid. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, the grid. It's very simple. It's it's just purely for me uh, to know if I was to make a painting. Well, what I do, I grid the canvas, and then I'll make a print for that canvas with the exact dimensions. So I'll grid it up just for ease of of trans. Um, transposition so ease of um, so I know where the mark is so that square there relates to that same square on the canvas so I just know where everything is very very quickly it's so I can get the paint up very quickly mm-hmm. you understand yeah yeah oh. that, because I, that's, uh, all, that's all it is mm-hmm. yeah th- this technique is also used when you want to to make a small picture to adapt it to a wider surface like on a wall for example Right, exactly. You kind of uh, agreed. So it's kind yeah. of uh, it, maintaining a structure, right, for you. That's right. It maintains a structure and it maintains the right ratios and all that. Yeah. Mhm, mhm. To not uh, get away too much from uh, from the initial, you know, 
idea or yeah it's kind of it's quite controlling isn't it yeah it's uh, it's not freestyle that's for sure yeah. <laughs> no. but also importantly because as i was saying when i go into the studio i make a collage of the painting every day or whatever it what happens when i work is that i will start the painting with which i've gridded up from that first collage but then invariably i will alter the painting so that grid becomes very useful when mm -hmm. i put the next layer on, which often will come from a different collage. But if that grid is always the same, I know where the new marks will go on top. Because I do like the first layer showing through areas of the top layer. They're multiple layered paintings as well as the collages. Mm -hmm. um, the, painting, the paintings take, I go through a long journey of change. So the original collage is often quite different to where the painting ends up. But I'm sure you will experience that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we, we can all see like the, the images you are making on a computer and then the result in painting, it's of course very, very different. But that's why I was asking because it's a very interesting process. Uh, yeah, the painting has to live as a painting. You know, the paint has to really live. You know, um, I mean, all these pictures you're putting up are based on photographic collages, but the paint has to really have a life of its own. And that's just through me painting quite quickly and letting drips and messes, I'm moving the, using a palette knife a lot. I paint with a palette knife to, to just push the paint over the surface and, and keep it really active. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people make, make the mistake of working from photographs. They become very, very dead. And flat. very static. Yeah, because all the answers are there for you. So you have to corrupt that all the time. Otherwise, you'll end up with a, with a, a pointless piece of art, really. Hmm, I like the idea of corrupting the image, the painting, yeah. the photography. Oh, yeah. It's an interesting Absolutely. concept. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, look, also here I can see the grid. Actually, I really like it. Yeah. It kind of gives a sense of, I don't know, a, a graphic flavor to it. Mm. Uh, I also really like after you, you start. That's interesting. People. Are... What? Sorry. Oh, no, no, you carry on. Uh, yeah. No, I was remembering that after you you went back in 2017, right, when you were in, uh, in Cluj, and you started yeah. this series of painting with Hawks, I think it was called Hawks, right? With the flower. Oh, Hoax, Hoax yes. Sorry, Hoax, Hoax series. yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah, 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 it's pronounced Hoax, yeah. Hoax. That's right. I, I did. I did. I spent about two years painting exactly. lots of flowers. <laughs> yes, it was. Well, yeah. dead flowers, actually. It was very, it's... very important. Yeah, they were dying. Yeah. Dying. Um, okay, but... do I paint directly on photographs? No, never. Someone just asked me. Yeah, I don't. I don't ever do that. Mm. Um, yeah, what I was. What? What? This is also related to photography. They have a strong sense of of uh, yeah uh, of reality, and 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 yes. uh, the like. You are using a, pho a a photographer style, you know, uh, of flash of light. Totally, yeah. But uh, yes, it was very important for me to, to make these so, look quite photographic. Yeah. So tell me a, a little bit because this. Even if uh, with, with uh, as a, as a technique, it's really really interesting and really uh, you know the yeah, way I can you, tell you all about that. the way you you be, you are able to capture yeah, that, that sense of light. I'm gonna find those. Where are those? Here. Yeah. The whole series started as a. Of, um, I mean, this one here is really really big. So that's about two meters, two, two meters. and a half meters wide, maybe. That one, yeah. Because most of the, the first pictures I did were very small. They were only only about this big, so about fifty by forty or whatever centimeters. And the whole approach, I just wanted to change the way I was thinking. 
So what I did, I, I started to think with this very strong abstract beginning to the So I would just put a canvas on the floor. I, would, I bought cheap acrylic paint and some less cheap acrylic paint because I was going to waste a lot. And I just threw paint at the surface of the canvas, which was great fun. It was really liberating, you know. And I used big squeegees to move and manipulate the paint on the surface on many, many layers. Just This is just the background. Mm -hmm. We can see. And here. then I would photograph. Yeah, and then I would photograph um, um, dying flowers. That and the first dying flowers I photographed was when I was in France in Normandy on holiday, and uh, I went into a church and I photographed these tiny flowers that had been left to die in a dark corner in an old jam jar, you know, and mm -hmm. the water had all gone really dark green and disgusting, and but in fact very very beautiful. This whole little a uh, whole little world inside in this green, you know, the flora and fauna with these wilting flowers. And there was something very pathetic and moving, moving about this. And because I was in a dark church, I used my camera flash, which created this very, very dark outline, which I just loved, you know, this, and it changed the look and the surface of the flowers, the petals became, they became quite alien looking. And then of course you blow them up, to blow them up quite large. And I would just paint them, um, on top of these abstract backgrounds. And sometimes I would leave areas missing. Um, I really liked the interaction between the abstract and the very, very, in this painting here you're showing now, that's a very, very big one. That's, that's huge as well. So I, so I was bringing in new techniques there as well. So I was using spray, spray guns as well here. So the whole series was very, very exciting to me because it, it allowed me to be much more playful and much more imaginative and bring in techniques that I'd never used before. So that, that, was, that was really good. So I, I, I did that work for about two years and I'm just starting to withdraw from the flowers, even though I could paint flowers forever. But in fact, um, I felt I wanted to somehow bring this abstract language back into my figurative work, but I haven't worked out, I haven't worked out how to do that yet. I haven't found the solution. Mm. because it's, it, I've done a few small ones that work quite well, but I'm trying to think now, this painting you're presenting on the screen is... This is beautiful, yes. Yeah, this is what? This is 213. So it's two metres by just under two metres. Yeah, it's so it's two quite metres. Big. It's quite big, yeah. So the flower area is about that large. So it's about the size of, yeah. And uh, I want to know if... I'm able to bring figures into paintings like this now. I haven't worked, that's my challenge to myself, you know. <laughs> mm. So this is the challenge for the, for your yeah, life? Yeah, because I mean, I've painted walls, I've painted floors, I've painted chairs, I've painted lamps with, with figures in. I'm wondering, can I put the figures into this more abstract space or, or can I even approach the figures in a more, more abstract way now? I don't know. I'm pulled in two ways because I'm really interested in rendering a reality, but I'm also really interested in this this clash that happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, you know what? It's interesting because seeing on Instagram they seem smaller. Actually, they they're really big. So this makes an even harder. Yeah, they are. Know. Yeah, that's right. It's very strange. Yeah, and. Dismantling your technique is even harder if uh, if you think they're mm. this big. But uh, look, yeah, here's a crazy. close up, yeah. and you could see that you use a lot of of, of brush strokes and uh, a lot of types of brushes, and uh, it's the, the surface is very. Oh yes. Yeah, if you look in that greeny yellow area on the left, oh, you've gone past it. If you see the area on the left, this one, yeah, that whole the light green, lime green area, yeah. I mean, for instance, that was made by me painting on. I was applying the the paint to a plastic bag, and just pressing the plastic bag onto the surface of the canvas and pulling it off quite quickly. So you got you got these fractured lines, and then um, I was also using paint rollers as well. You know, so rolling the paint on and uh, painting on sheets of plastic and so I get getting these strange effects yeah that's right so painting on top of that was really mm -hmm. exciting 
Mm-hmm. And then this area in the blue here, that, that was done with a spray gun. So this friend of mine gave me these spray guns he uses. His job is he paints backdrops in films. So he will paint. Uh, some of you may have seen the film Dunkirk by Christopher Nolan, for instance. Well, he painted yeah. a lot of the battleships that are in that oh, film really? with these spray guns that he lent. Yeah. I'm so this was the first one I did. Now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was, it was really hard to, uh, it was very, very hard to control. It's also quite toxic. Yeah, I seen that in one of your photos you have a mask on your face. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a real so, mess. You have to. Um, hmm. So tell me, when you you were doing these backgrounds, but then when you would come yeah. to paint the you know the the front line basically the first uh, yeah the characters in which in this case the flowers. Were you needed for the background to be totally dry or not necessarily? Yeah, mostly. Mostly. Not necessarily, but yes, it helps. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I like the color to be picked up by the surface. It depends what I want, really. You know, um, I think this one was was pretty much dry because a lot of this background was painted with acrylic paint. So the blues and the whites and the greens, they're, they're all acrylic. Mm -hmm. And then the the flower is oil yeah. so it would have been pretty much dry yeah so yes i found them a, a very interesting series to make really uh it really brought back some fun in the studio you know playfulness is that sort of really with this uh yeah flower series. yeah yeah and you can see from my pictures you're going through, I can see pictures that don't exist still be now because I've painted over them or that, or I photographed them at an intermediate stage, you know. So a lot of these paintings here, we took, we took them, the gallery I'm with, took them to the Armory Art Fair in New York and we did a presentation of all the flower paintings, more or less as they're hanging like that in my studio. I just put them up as I would do them. And we kind of recreated that in America, and it was it was it was good fun, like a salon hang, you know. Mm -hmm. But here it starts to get really broken down and abstract. And I really like this painting, but um, I think a lot of people who follow my work wanted to see more reality in it. And uh, but for me, it's interesting because I like the way flowers are, are disappearing into this strange chaos, you know. Oh. <laughs> Were you ever tempted to go totally abstract on your... Well, of course, yeah, but it doesn't engage me as much. But I, I, to be honest, I do look at a lot of abstract painting. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of abstract painting exciting and visceral, like listening to some really great heavy metal, you know. It's kind of, it's like a sugar <laughs> rush for me sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah. Do you relate when you work on your uh, that now that you mentioned heavy metal? When you work in the studio, do you, can you relate with a certain type of music as you are painting a certain type of yeah. image? Yeah. So what oh, kind of music were you, um, you listening when no, you? No, I, I would actually no. I, I, I think maybe not. I do listen to certain types of music when I'm painting. I don't have an image that goes with certain music, though. No, I wish I did. That's a really nice idea, isn't it? You, you have you have Vaughan Williams when you're painting a tree in the sky or whatever. And then you have um, Black Sabbath when you're painting a I don't know a car crash or something. <laughs> yeah. <It's, laughs> On the yeah. same canvas, both of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, but do you listen to Black Sabbath? I, I like Black Sabbath so Yeah, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I listen to lots of music. Yeah, Black Sabbath is a favorite. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's good to hear. I'm glad to hear that, Anka. That's good. Yeah, well, I, I I like the singer even now. He's, he's quite... Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> he became a bit of a celebrity in the beginning of um, reality TV here, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, this is how I end up uh, listening to Black Sabbath because when he, when his show came up on MTV Reality, I didn't know he was a singer. I know he was he was right. Singer. Yeah, I just thought he was a a, a junkie or something. He, oh, absolutely, he, he looked quite yeah, yeah. changed. 
But then yeah. I, I got into the, his music and I he's a great singer. I love Jim. him. Wow, look at this texture here. So I could see, uh, as you were saying, that in this series, you you let yourself to be maybe less rational as you are yeah. your realistic painting. Instinctive. Think, yeah, you know? more instinctive. And I really, I'm really proud of this painting here. You see, I mean, that's just a fragment of it, but it, it was a long journey to create that surface. But it was just really good fun. Because if it just looked a bit rubbish the next day, I would just come in and paint over it completely with a squeegee mm -hmm. or something and create a whole new surface that I couldn't even have predicted. Because when I'm going to paint a hand, for instance, or paint a foot, I kind of know what it's going to look like at the end. Yeah. When I'm doing something like this. It was much more open and the roll of the dice, you know. And I really like that. I, I, I re that's why I, that's why I really enjoy painters who are able to just for me they seem to just start with a canvas and they just go you know they just paint and I, I, I think that's amazing I mean I plan a lot of my work but I think artists who just seem to just I don't know if these artists exist but just go in and there's a figure here and a trick whatever they're doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it just comes out of them I think that's amazing I love that what, did you I'm able to do that with my drawing, but my painting, I can't do that. Hmm. Yes. Uh, well, you are talking here about being mm, like uh, more uh, freestyle painter. Didn't you like encounter this situation now that you had the, the thing with, with uh, the broken arm? Isn't it kind of, didn't you find uh, yes, a, the same feeling? Or it was here. It was happy. Similar. And now it's more they're kind of, they're, they're different. <laughs> yeah, maybe. The thing is, um, with with these big abstract paintings, you need to have a lot of physical strength, you know. And, and um, I I couldn't do that with just one hand. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it there is a lot of accident. So the the left hand work is much lighter. Exactly. Yeah. So people thought this was painted on a photograph, right? Well, I've never done that in my life. But that's outrageous. I know. <laughs> but but you said that people were asking this, Justin, didn't you? Like you make a transfer on your canvas, and then you know, like like go never. No, no, that's that's just years and years of practice. No, no, mm -hmm. absolutely not. People do think that I paint some photographs sometimes, but when you actually see the actual object, you realize it, it is actual brushstrokes, you know. Yeah. yeah. That's what figurative painting is as well. There's delusion, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Well, so these are all, yeah, background. I think we might have, oh, we have some questions in the chat. Okay, let's have some questions then. Oh, well, there are long questions, but please also formulate them and uh, ask uh, ask ahead, please. So as Anna's saying, I'm quite curious about the impact your exhibition made during the summer pandemic. Um, yeah, certainly Turner is a... Uh, so what is it saying? Did the, are the white clothed humans in the compositions linked to the medical personnel? Well, yes. The smoke, the blur reminds me maybe peculiarly of Turner. Well, yeah, absolutely. The amorphous gaseous atmosphere. Hmm. Well, oh, thank you. Do I paint directly on photographs? No, no. As we just talk Simply about drawing. <laughs> Yeah. Are there artists that inspire you, like the subject matter or the technique? Oh, that's a tricky one, isn't it? That's the one. Um, yeah, there's plenty of artists that I like. Uh, uh, just I mean, figurative painters. Answer, uh, sorry, uh, these questions no, no, are from uh, students from second year, so just so you know. Okay. Are there any ones there you want me to answer? You can curate them, anchor. No, answer. You, you read them, just yeah. answer whatever and however you want to. I mean, well, for instance, the artist that I admire, 
I mean, I, I like figurative painters. I've always liked um, that Neo Rauch, for, in, for instance. Um, I've always liked Degas, uh, that whole scene. Um, I've mentioned that I really like abstract painting as well, like de Kooning and people like that. I mean, it, it depends kind of what mood I'm in, really. I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm, I might I have all my books here at home and I'll be looking at, um, well, say Goya, for instance. Mm. I, I might be in the mood to, to look at all these etchings. But then the next day I might be looking at Cassatt's etchings of children and mothers, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you it's have funny, you watch, what, what's this film you... Uh, oh yes, I remember that film now. It's a film in your studio, I That's think. That's my... Yeah, I think I just walked in and filmed it one day. I'm not quite sure why I did that. What have I written? Uh, <laughs> uh, I pulled oh, out... Oh yes, I... I Good morning. I had some. I had a studio meeting. Yes. You you mentioned studio yeah. tourist, so you were a tourist in your own studio. Yes. <laughs> Did I say that right? Okay. Well, yes, it's quite nice because it was. It, you, I don't have my works out in the studio like this normally. I have them stacked like that. So I, I was suddenly seeing the work. Oh yeah, there's it. There he is. Tell well, me. One of my first jobs as a. Yeah, uh, one of my first jobs as a portrait painter was to paint David Bowie. So yeah, that's a photograph from the time. And you said he yeah. asked me. So he as he called you up or meet you up? And yeah, he did. He actually yeah. rang me up. <laughs> he rang up. He rang you up. Yeah. It was, you know, I, I may have met David Bowie. <laughs> Could you please? Yeah, because you know, I mentioned I had this painting in the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, which gave me was like an advert for my work. I had I did a portrait of Harold Pinter, the, the English playwright, and it's in the collection, still is there, and that meant that people could see my work. So one of his art people saw my portrait of Pinter, and David Bowie was looking for someone to paint a portrait of him and his wife Iman. Um, so yes, he, he did quite literally ring up. Uh, actually, I think what happened first, his art agent rang up first and said, I have a client who's interested in, in a picture. How much do you charge? And I said, a thousand pounds. So they said, okay, fine. So then the, the, it turned out the client was David Bowie. So I think if, if I knew it was David Bowie, I would have said it would cost, my portraits cost, you know, 15,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds. <laughs> so that was quite clever. But yeah, he rang up and I think um, my, my other half, Kathy, answered the phone. And uh, yeah, and off it went. It was um, very funny. So I went to meet him. No, no, he came to the studio first. I had it in my first studio in London, which uh -huh. was actually very in, in the center of London, a very nice space. But it, I, and uh, yeah, he came in a big black limo and you know, you can just imagine it was just crazy. Yeah. I was like 20, I was like 20, 24 or something, I was really young, you know. So that was kind of strange. <laughs> and from all yeah, the so he has with him this is what he gave you to make a portrait out of him or this this is something you no, no, found this, I, I i took this photograph myself and of this him. is a photograph this is a photograph made like 25 years later and the photographs got all wrecked and trashed because mm -hmm. it because this was the one of the first times i had to paint a portrait from photographs not from life mm -hmm. because it was a big commission yeah. i did nine paintings for them in the end and nine yeah but i could only meet i met him about three times i think so it wasn't long enough to do that many works so i had to take photographs as references and i i didn't really know how to do that but um i had to because needs must so i do have a few photographs of him at home and in the attic it's kind of great and it's also funny to think that he's younger there than, than i am now <laughs> oh, yeah. really? I also saw something that escaped while searching through your uh, Instagram. You had also a commission for Nick Cave, which I also really enjoy listening to. Is that true? No, it's not. No? Damn, I wish it was. But you, you had... that? Yeah, well, oh. I'm just gonna find that. Look, this one. Painting this to Nick Cave. Ah, you oh, mean? I painted, uh, oh, I see. I, what I, meant was I, was, I was listening to him. Yeah, that's oh, the music oh. I was listening to. Well, then yeah, we, yeah. 
then we kind of meet in the music like yeah i listen a lot to nick cave so yes so it yes. wasn't a commission <laughs> no 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 that's interesting yeah that's just the expression of use yes i see um yeah, that's yeah i just think it was a, like dark stuff so uh do you have any questions any other questions please the man is here for you <laughs> i have a lot of questions to ask him but i want to invite you to do it well we can we can chat away and so if people are a bit shy or thinking or you know it's hard to, we can just carry on for a bit if you want what's the time how are we doing for time uh okay. We have uh, a little more over an hour now. Uh, so, uh, how how are you with the time? When you have to finish? If uh, well, we... I need to get, I need to get. I, I'd say about another half an hour or so. I need to get to the studio for this Bucharest collection. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we're gonna chat for more twenty minutes. To more twenty and minutes. That, okay? and that, just to answer a question, someone's asked me. That is a stuffed jackdaw. Yeah. What yes. are you doing there? Why do you have it? <laughs> well, there's quite a few. There's quite a bit of taxidermy in this room. We've got a, a deer over there, another bird. Yeah, uh, this is the second jackdaw I've had. First one got eaten by moths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, look, we have some questions here. Okay. Oh, it's the pigeon. Ah, this is what you answer. Ah, okay. What color do you prefer? Uh, I like pink. I quite like pink. Pink? Yeah. I like Are pink, you yeah. Be there? I, it, dep it depends what um, the context. I mean, for instance, yesterday I was walking in the park and everyone, it was a very, it was a very dull day and everyone was wearing their, their, their coats and they, these children were running around in bright cadmium yellow hooded jackets which look really beautiful in this in the in the dark brown gray of this sort of garden i was in and then um i saw another child wearing very pale orange boots in the and splashing about in a puddle and they were really beautiful so in fact color is about context really so um i use greens a lot you know i love greens so I, if I, I, ha I have no favorite color it's uh, it's the context that has to be right. I think. Okay, another any more questions? Things were there. <clears throat> do you doubt, Justin? Do you doubt your narrative? Do you doubt your approach? Do you doubt your reality and the dimension? Yeah, constantly. In which... Yeah, constantly. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting that you asked me that. Yeah, it's um, of course. I think if I didn't, there'd be something very wrong um i'm constantly I don't questioning think that many people, yeah. i don't think that many people uh, actually talk about that as it's a sign of uh, weakness you know to, oh, to really? that within, within the yeah. within the this societal uh, reality mm. you know you're supposed to know and be confident and like uh, but I think it's very right. you mean like in a, yeah you mean like in an art context a kind of a macho kind of scene yeah. yeah maybe you're right yeah yeah you're striving for that goal you kind of you, you i mean yes i'm i'm driven of course but every time i make a piece of work it it, it just full it falls away from me i'm certain when i'm starting and it just starts to collapse as soon as i put things together it, it crumbles away in front of me and um, i feel like uh, a lot of creative yeah, energy yeah. coming out of doubt and it shouldn't be looked at um, as an obstacle, but as something that you can work with and be That's pushed. very cool, yeah. I really agree with that. I, no, you're absolutely right. I think um, people should talk more about it, and it can be used as a tool for benefit, you know, that takes you takes you somewhere else. You, you can't move forward unless you're doubting and have to adjust and think and problem solve and somehow find... That, uh, that new place otherwise things would never you'd, you'd just still you'd stay static wouldn't you you'd atrophy yeah yeah no, nice question <laughs> well uh, talking about this justin 
what do you do when uh, you know think about that we have a lot of young really young uh, painters to be here so uh, what would you do if you get stuck you know like like a sort of writer's block but in terms of mm. painting well, what, what is this something that you do to, you know, to pass over that, that feeling, that mood? Yeah, I mean, yesterday I was a bit like that because I totally messed up something I was doing on Saturday. So I would say, what helped me was going for a walk in the park, just, just leaving the space, just getting out, just, just compartmentalizing the problem and putting it there. And, and physically taking yourself somewhere else. I, mean, I, I walk a lot and um, it always, it always, so, as soon as I leave the door, through the door, things start flooding in. When I'm confronted with the subject in front of me, I never move forward um, if, I'm in a, if I'm stuck. So I have to leave the room. And I think there are neurological experiments where something physically happens in your brain when you walk through a door you know i think something does happen you know the amount of times people walk into a room and they've forgotten what they came in for i think mm -hmm. the same thing happens when you when you walk out the door into a garden or into a park or just walk down the road you know something something frees up because you'll never if you're in, if you've just worked on a painting six hours and then it's turned into a disaster which happens a lot i would say about half of what i do i probably paint over uh, easily um, it's not going to suddenly solve itself magically after six hours so you have to leave the room get out leave the studio go for a long walk yeah and then come back in the next day after a night's sleep and then you can then you can either a throw it away which is a really good thing to do or b um, apply clarity and fresh thinking to it and that mess that you made actually might be rather exciting and might be um you might suddenly realize with clarity is actually pointing to a future for you so what you thought was bad yesterday actually might be a signpost to a new a new place for you to explore anyway <laughs> yeah there we go uh we have another question from uh from a from a student. I do. I do use a palette knife all the time. Many palette uh, knives. Uh, Flavia Lugigan. Hi, you mentioned the disruption of the photography in the painting process. Besides the digital intervention, does this happen naturally to you while painting or is it a conscious effort? Yes, love your work. Thank you. Um, the yeah, I think when I'm painting, I'm always disrupting it. Yeah, with the knives, I'm I'm always pulling the paint around. I'm, I'm forever trying to break up. That, that, I try to keep a, a line between the description of what I'm interested in painting, that the, literally that the, the volume, the forms, the drawing. I'm paying attention to that, and I'm paying a lot of attention to how the paint is sitting on the surface and what's happening. And if it's looking really dead, I will take a knife to it. I will lift it off with a with a rag. I will, you know, I will corrupt it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, sometimes I want the clarity. Sometimes I want the, the distortion and the, um, yeah, something, something to happen to the paint. When, when, you, when you're presented with a complete image, it's, it's banal and boring. So that's why I try to lift as much paint off as possible. You know. Uh, oh look, here we are. Here we are. That was clues there. Yes, that was. You might recognise. Of these that's maris's studio his oh. old studio um then this is at oh. your art school yeah this yeah. is uh you know oh yeah, yeah the shelves not there anymore i mean the uh, shelves, yes but not the works not the works no no the fire department department doesn't approve us i was gonna say yeah we had, we had, we had, we had yeah we had a few fires at art school <laughs> yeah I have a short question if there is any there's no other from the students. Justin, yeah. how do you decide if uh, an idea or a subject matter is um, 
good enough to transform it in a series of paintings or it should remain only in the sketchbook. One of our previous guests said that we are always hunting for an idea for an exhibition. Yeah, I, find it, it, I, find, I find it very hard to, to find subject matter, actually. Yeah. Um, it takes a long time and it, I, I find I start quite broadly and then gradually it focuses in the narratives and the stories and things. That, I don't just start with an idea. I, I can't. I'd never have that kind of inspiration, like that cliched inspiration. Of, That's it. I'm going to paint hazmats today, or I'm going to paint smoke bombs or whatever. It's um, it's a very slow journey. That. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. approach it in narrow circles, <laughs> getting closer and yes, closer I focus it in. Yeah, I do. I do. Occasionally, like mm -hmm. for instance, just seeing the balloons passing by on my Instagram that. That, that was a sudden moment of walking down a street and seeing some balloons outside a restaurant in London. And I took a photograph. I thought that there's something that's really resonates with me there because it's related to light and color and skin and tension, all that. So very occasionally an object might become uh, of interest to me, like a plastic bag I see in the street um, things like this, but actual ideas and stories and concepts that's a longer journey, really. Yeah, and I wish I had a, a, a clearer idea sometimes. Yeah, to, just, just to get things moving faster, really. Yeah. I'm gonna put you, uh, because we are, we are approaching the finish of our conversation, like a more technical um, question. For example, yes. when, when you want to do your uh, your balloons, or uh, but let's say the balloons because you mentioned them, what is yeah. what do you do to to really get out the, the texture and the tension of the material? Because there's a tension, there is a gonflated material, right? So is it? Yes. Pure yeah, it's funny because when I, when I first when I started painting balloons, I had no idea how to do it. You know, I had no idea what what. There was no book saying this is how you paint balloons but there's loads exactly. of books about how to paint a head or paint a flower or something exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. i mean somewhere in, somewhere in that in this would be a picture of my first balloon painting but i think it's actually be on my website i think but um it's just from years and years and years of of learning to know what you're looking at so if you understand what you're looking at you can deconstruct that uh situation and reproduce it with with these strange mud like paints you know this paste we call paint so so i suppose i had to look at the very darkest points of the balloon and the very lightest points with the highlights and things and work out what happens in between it's very strange when you try it's very easy to see a highlight and very easy to see a shadow but what happens in that light bandwidth between the two mm -hmm. and that light bandwidth is what describes that surface and also inside that surface, you'll, you will see clues about the other side of the surface. And you have to somehow make a decision. But what of these visual clues are you going to take to make this balloon? Because you can't, you can't take in every single visual information that your brain is receiving because your eyes are constantly moving about. So A, you've got to make sure the shape is right. Mm -hmm. And... Um, try to find a way how to paint a highlight in an interesting way. I was trying to do that because I didn't want to make it look like it was airbrushed. So I would put on, I would, I would find a very, very good white. I would put quite a lot of white on for the highlight, maybe with a, maybe with a knife, a blob, and I would blur it out into the surrounding edges. And then from that, I would understand what next tone I would have to do. And I would gradually build it up like that. Uh, towards the dark delineated shape of the balloon and that and that kind of gave me a clue about where to go um and of course the color was something i added to it as well which was an added layer of complexity because i invented the color the balloons i was photographing were just very white white or black they, they, they weren't these weird putrid rotting flesh colors i wanted to bring to them the yellows and things but that was quite hard. So I used, I did use some quite transparent colours with that as well. Yeah, technically it was a challenge. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
and really, really quick, I, I can see, well, guys, I've asked you to put the questions even from beginning, but I see only now they are getting inspired. Before you start the painting, do you have a final result in your mind? I think you kind of somehow answered it, but if you want. Yeah, I think I do. I think I do, but it, it invariably changes. Yeah, as I was explaining earlier on, um, the journey of make, going towards that painting means it gets further away. And I, the idea, I realize, is often um, could be improved when I'm actually painting. So the painting will be different to the original idea in the end. It's rare when a painting finishes as I expected it would be at the start. Yeah. And another question, uh, I'm going to sum it up. What do you do, I don't know, when you, when you face a certain critique from the outside or your self-doubt, how, how do you make it, uh, you know, to pass over this, let's say, mental state that might impair you to, in, to, to paint? Well, say that bad criticism, you mean? Is that uh, what's, yeah. What, yeah. What, yeah. Uh, you just got to ignore it and crack on. You just, you know, you have to maybe speak to some other people. It's, it's, it's worth speaking to several people if you're really worried about something. Um, if you have negative criticism, you got to take it on board, think about it, reject it or learn from it. You know? Nothing oh, else you I, can do. You said it perfectly. Yeah. So reject it or learn from it. Guys, yeah. students, you know, pin these words up because they should stick sure. with you you know so so you don't get to, you manage over the time over time to to deal with this uh with bad or good critique or yourself critique out i know you know out of criticism so you manage to move on yes of course you do you have so to as, a, as an artist really uh you need also a strength uh, a strong mental state right I mean, you well, really yeah, you do, which, yeah. which is terrible because most artists, including myself, are quite fragile narcissists. I mean, it's kind of difficult, exactly. isn't it? So, <laughs> it's, it's a hard one. It's a, yeah, it's another it's self, ground. self destructing, yeah. <laughs> it's a hard one, uh, but I think if you if, uh, certainly talking to your, your students, you need to realize that, um. You know, the life of an artist is, is very isolated and, and um, it's pretty boring and difficult with occasional births of real fun and joy. And it's more difficult now because, of course, we're all isolated and we don't have private views to go to. And, you know, all the things that we used to enjoy and come together at parties for friends, exhibitions and things, that's all ended now. So I don't know. It's, um, yeah, it's just trickier. Having said that, social media now. Um, means being an artist is easier to communicate your ideas to, to an audience. It's much quicker now. I mean, when we were students, it was 35 millimeter transparencies put in an envelope and sent off to someone, which would just be ignored. You'd never see them again. <clears throat> now we just put it on, well, Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and it's great. Exactly. Very powerful tools are available for us all now. Yeah. Well, guys, if you don't have, we're gonna end with this uh, really quick question because I ended uh, all the interviews with, did quite with these uh, questions. Uh, like, um, Justin, if you have like uh, any sort of a, advice for the young to be painters slash artists. I think I just said it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you did, but you know, I did. As, a, as a goodbye, just say another word. Uh, well, okay, let's have a think. Um, I mean, what would you do if you look back at you, uh, you being in the first uh, year of of university? What would you say to yourself? You know, to to get um, you carry on. Well, yeah, don't. I mean, I would say don't worry so much. But <laughs> yeah, don't worry so much. Yeah, but also, I mean, it's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think whatever you do, yeah, just don't worry. Um, you've just got to really just work hard. You just have. It doesn't come easy. You just have to work. Nothing. Nothing comes quickly. I mean, I, I, when I went to art school, I couldn't really paint. 
I could draw quite well, but I couldn't really paint. So I've basically had to teach myself how to do that. So, and that just comes from working and working and working. And it's pretty simple. That is it. You know? Perfect. There's no, there's no shortcut. Yeah. Well, so don't really go to work. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, say so that again. It just cuts out, Luana. Yeah. Don't worry, go to work. Yeah, don't worry, work hard. Yeah, yeah, work yeah. hard. Don't worry, work hard. Yeah. And yeah. remember, there are no shortcuts. Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, but also enjoy it and explore, you know. It's not all. It, enjoy, explore, be open, be really open to, you know, be driven, but be open to new experiences and new thinking. It's very easy to go down the, down the railway track on the, on the lines, you know. But you have to you have to learn to look for the those chaotic moments and learn from the chaos as well actually i think that's something that's quite important but that comes with maturity really well justin thank you very much for your time and uh, well, for your time you. yeah and uh, um, yeah. thanks justin <laughs> you're welcome it's been good to see you all Thank you, Dustin. It was nice to see you. Yeah, it's very good to see you too. I hope we get a chance to come out to Cluj again soon, you know, maybe next year. Because uh, well, we were hoping, we would have, would have really liked to have come this year, for, but obviously not. Um, yeah, we need to do it again because it's um, such a great place and it was, we really enjoyed meeting you all out there. Yeah, yeah. Just to get rid of this pandemic stuff and we are Absolutely. waiting for you. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, till next time then. Well, yeah. uh, I'm going to close the recording now and okay. uh, thank you all for being here and uh, especially Justin. You're now forever our friend. <laughs> uh, it's lovely. Lovely to talk to you all. It's really, really been marvelous. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs>